but uh, hey, this is a specific question on limestone formation. Mm -hmm. there, there are critics, and some of them are in the chat at the moment, who claim that um, uh, this could not have been laid in turbulent water flow. Can mm -hmm. you provide an explanation for where all the limestone came from and how it was laid? So, who is Joseph Hubbard, or Indiana Joe Hubbard as he likes to be called? He is the director of Creation Research UK and is a speaker, writer, and researcher for creation research worldwide. He has a bachelor's in earth sciences and has been somewhat popular in the creationist realm for many years. Yeah, so there's two there's two things to comment on it. The first one is, uh, where do we get the idea from that it's a uh, shallow marine-based sediment? Um, the other one is, what is a different or alternative explanation to how this limestone actually formed, right? So That's a very honest way to approach the question. What does the majority of the science say? How do I disagree? Completely legitimate. So the first thing you have to look at is, well, we get our idea of a shallow marine carbonate sort of uh, calciferous ooze, as it's called beautifully, um, from modern deposits. Right, we go out and we look, we find in the real world some of these uh, sort of uh, chalky deposits at the bottom of shallow seas, which are slowly accumulating small things called coccolithophores. Coccolithophores are the sort of shells off of tiny little plankton, which they fall off, eventually clump together, sink down to the bottom of the sea floor, and begin to form this ooze. Now, this ooze builds up and it's uh, what is claimed to end up producing the limestone deposits. So it's forming around us today, right? Uh, but the argument is it happens so incredibly slowly that, uh, and it really does form at the rates that we, or, you know, uh, very, very slow rates, like one inch per thousand years or whatever. It forms at extremely slow rates. And they say, well, therefore chalk and limestone, which has its base in this sort of uh, ooze that we see forming today, must have taken millions of years to form. I don't have an issue with what Indiana Joe said here about the modern interpretation of limestone formation. We can go to places in the world and watch limestone be formed. Therefore, it's safe to assume since limestone is being formed in these locations, that is how limestone is formed. Well, there's a very simple way of disproving that and showing that you can't actually correlate the two. And that is to ask this. Number one, how many fossils are there buried in this uh, Califerous ooze or this modern day limestone or chalk? The answer absolutely none because it is not being laid down fast enough to produce fossils. I'm really wondering how Indiana Joe can verify the claim that no modern limestone formation has any fossils or shells or something like that in it. Sure, I'm sure you can find a place that limestone is being formed and there are no fossils. Hence, you find limestones without lots of fossils. You can also go to places where limestone is being formed, such as this video, and there are fossils embedded within the soon-to-be limestone. And you find limestone that is covered in fossils, fossiliferous limestone. So, I really need you to verify that claim. Joe. Indiana Joe. Um, number two, are there any creatures being trapped in it that are not being destroyed pretty quickly? The answer, no, it happens very, very quickly. The creatures, anything that lives around it, uh, just gets destroyed and dies. I think what Indiana Joe just said is more detrimental to his cause of a worldwide flood than is detrimental to my example of a slow fossilization process. But besides that point, what he's trying to get at here, I believe, is since the deposition rate is so slow, in modern limestone formations, you have a hard time making fossils of any variety. And limestone, of course, is full of fossils. Here's a fantastic example. This is an entire school of fish that has been, well, fossilized. So what did kill and bury this school of fish in the act of being a school of fish? Well, if you ask the experts, they would tell you something quick, like a collapsing sand dune could have frozen the fish in a matter of seconds, presenting a portrait of the fish caught in the act. They will also tell you that it's impossible really to tell what exactly killed the fish or how fast it happened. Scientists are open to many interpretations of what happened. 
None of these interpretations are demanding a global worldwide flood. I would argue a global worldwide flood would be a bigger issue for the majority of fossils that we do find, which are individual examples, such as this fish here. How is the flood simultaneously going to kill everything that exists, but then capture one individual fish? Why does one fish die? I'm sure, is this fish a loner? We have many examples of one fish in a large span of area. Why did this individual fish die when schools of fish die over there? I say there are different interactions over time. You say one global flood did everything in the matter of what, 40 days? Okay, question three. Um, is the uh, ooze that is being formed today in a pure form? Because you see, when we go to the White Cliffs of Dover, it is pure chalk. There's no contamination. There's no sediment or muck or, you know, rotting stuff caught up in it. It's brilliantly preserved and it's pure. Wait a minute here. Question one and question three are the exact opposite. Do you want... Number one, how many fossils are there buried in this uh, califerous ooze or this modern day limestone or chalk? Or do you want... Okay, question three. Um... Is the uh, ooze that is being formed today in a pure form? Because you can't have it both ways. The president of the key to the past fails because there are fossils, or the president of the key to the past fails because there aren't fossils. Joe, you're having your fossils and you're eating them too. Pick a side, buddy. He's bluffing! No creature would willingly make an idiot out of itself! Well, no, in modern day ooze uh, scenarios, uh, it's full of sediment and sand and fish poo and scales and all sorts of gross gunge, right? Why wouldn't there be fish poop all over the place if Noah's flood happened? That doesn't make any sense to me. Why everything that you're saying is a problem due to the white cluster of Dover being pure would be a problem for you as well, right? If the white cluster of Dover formed during the flood, What's to stop fish poop from getting in there? And does fish poop even survive the lithification process? That's just such a weird argument to make. It's confusing and it's stupidity. Beyond all that, the White Cliffs of Dover are full of stuff. They're full of fossils. <laughs> I mean, they have fish parts in them. They're fossilized fish parts. Again, you're wrong. You go and look at modern day deposits and you see that they're forming slowly today. Therefore, that's how it always happened. Of course, the problem is you can't actually compare the two because they are so different. Because one forming today doesn't have fossils. It doesn't have even have fossils forming. Fossils get destroyed or creatures get destroyed as soon as they fall in. It's thoroughly contaminated with muck and gunge and ooze and, you know, disgusting stuff. Whereas when you go and look at the, uh, you know, the rock, the limestone, the chalk, they're majority pure, they are full of fossils, they're all full of fossils which are pointing the same way, which indicates turbidity currents and flow, they are full of fossils which are turned upside down and are uh, lying on their back, which uh, shows that they've been transported, they're not in a life position. So clearly something doesn't match up between what we observe today and what we actually see in the rock record. All right, let's go through the modern limestone deposit list here. One, modern limestone deposits don't have fossils. Well, no shit. Fossils take a long time to form. We wouldn't see that in, in our lifetimes. Although, in your model, fossils can form very rapidly, so technically shouldn't we see fossils in our lifetimes forming in these, or formed in these fossil beds? Oh, I guess that covers two as well. Three, in the slow deposition environment, the fossils will all get destroyed before they can become fossils. Yeah, sure, that's why fossils are so rare. But, as given before with the school of fish method, the rapid burial can happen via many different mechanisms. It's not the collection of the coccolithophore shells that's going to be burying these things necessarily. And now we get to fish poop. Somehow, fish poop disproves the age of the earth. You just blew my mind. <laughs> And now on to Indiana Joe's arguments. His first one is that the limestone that you see when you go to an outcrop is majority pure. 
I don't know where he got this information from. I couldn't find some aggregate study of all limestone that exists on the planet, but I was able to find, by googling it very easily, a study in New Zealand of over 2,000 limestone samples, from which they discovered that almost half of the limestone they sampled was impure by definition, meaning 50 to 85 percent CaCO3 by volume. That's not very pure. The majority of the limestone out there is not White Cliffs of Dover pure. That's why limestone comes in such variety of colors. His second point is that limestone is full of fossils. How is this an argument for you and against me? I have no problem with limestone being full of fossils. The third point is this, again, unsighted direction of fossils. Where does this come from? All fish and all limestone fossils everywhere have a preferred direction? Who measured that? I need a reference for this. And his last point is that fish are on their backs when fossilized. I don't even know what that means. I don't know how to address that point. It's so weird. Between I don't know which is worse, fish poop or fish backs. What's an alternative explanation then? Well, John Mackay, I believe, he's, as you say, touched on it. I watched his interview that you did with him, and there certainly seems to be much more of a chemical process involved, uh, something which most geologists have never actually considered. <laughs> To my knowledge, Liar! Uh, both myself and John have noticed that there are extremely important connections between microbes, bacteria, plankton, you know, little sort of multicellular, oh, sorry, yeah, single cellular uh, microscopic creatures, enzymes, chemical processes, and limestone formation. Spoiler warning I tried to look around their website and found no articles or no papers or no anything about the supposed link. Uh, and this is starting to reach the scientific papers, right? So we thought we need to do some investigation. Um, we're both geologists. We come from a geology background. We know wonderful stuff about geology. But what we don't know too much about is organic chemistry, which is where this chemical process comes in. And a few people have touched on it. So we went and sat down with a world expert in organic chemistry who said to us, I've never thought of looking at it that way before, and I wish I knew more about this, but I'm not a geologist. And so for the first time ever, a geologist and an organic chemist sat down and actually started to work together, right? <laughs> I'm going to throw Indiana Joe a bone here and say, you know what? This interview was designed for the layman, was designed for the people that may not know a lot of science to find out about interesting flood geology. So. Him not going into detail about this supposed conversation is acceptable for the interview. However, it would be nice if they would have posted a link in the description below the video to information on this supposed meeting of the minds so that people who maybe do understand a bit more can dive in and learn something. But nothing is posted and I tried to figure out what they're talking about here, this conversation, anything relevant, and I found nothing. So, I guess I have to take your word that some revelation of geology and biology is going to come out of your conversation here, because I can't find anything. The extraordinary claims are not supported by extraordinary evidence. How are we taught from day one that ge uh, rock formations are formed? The answer is from the bottom to the top. The bottom layer got there first, then the next layer settled on top, then the next layer, then the next layer, and the next layer, and the next layer, and so on and so forth. And there you get your wonderful geologic column from bottom to top um, with the label of millions of years. First proposed by a creationist, by the way, um, Nicholas Stino. What the the problem is, everything we see in the world around us shows that rock layers don't form bottom to top, they form sideways. Say what? Because if you need to get sediment uh, to actually form a deposit, you need to erode that sediment from somewhere, you need to carry that sediment from somewhere, and you need to have moving sediment in order to deposit. All of that requires water which is flowing sideways, carrying that slurry of uh, stuff in it. Think about a beach, think about tides, think about rivers, think about deltas. The hell does it mean to deposit sideways? I know he knows what the law of superposition means. 
oldest in the bottom, youngest on top. Layers are flat for a reason, because they are laid flat. A river, sure, the sediment is moving to the side, but when the sediment falls out of the current and is deposited on the floor of the riverbed or whatever, it lays flat. The sediments don't, like, pile up like walls or something. I don't even know how to visualize what he's saying. It's such a weird, weird concept. Like, we got fish poop, we got fish backs, and now we got vertical sediment deposition. I I don't get it. I really don't get what he's trying to say here. Okay, scale that up, and you've got the perfect explanation for a stationary, but moving sideways, so the particles are all suspended, moving at the same speed, carrying the limestone and the chalk along, and depositing it as it's going, burying the creatures which are also traveling in the one direction. So, limestone deposits are actually the result of mud flows of calcium carbonate during the flood and then so the white cliffs of dover are like this multi hundred foot tall underwater flow of super super highly concentrated calcium carbonate that just stopped in lower england and captured the fossils that it did apparently nothing else really because there's a lot of fossils but there's a lot of like shells that's not really full of fish so it somehow killed all the underwater snails and mollusks but anything bigger than that somehow didn't get caught up in this again I'm trying to picture this it's like an underwater mud flow which is, happens right but it's calcium carbonate have we ever seen that or is that like a only God did it once sort of event? And like for the White Cliffs of Dover, he like did a really tall version of it. Am I, am I thinking about this correctly? Am I, am I, tell me what I'm doing wrong here. Because <laughs> that's the more reasonable explanation. This giant, tall, massive wall of moving calcium carbonate in solution in the ocean that's a lot more reasonable than when you go down to the Caribbean and see limestone actually being formed that's the stupid one it's the one we actually can go and touch and this thing we've never seen before that's reality that's not how it works that's not how any of this works. Now, there's a lot more research to do about that. There's a lot more research to do into the chemical aspect of limestone. Um, but simply saying we know it's a slow, gradual deposition doesn't work. The fossils go to show that. Uh, and if you want to try and match it up to any slow, gradual process, that is worlds away from anything that we see um, in the real world. I have to admit, Indiana Joe here is less of a dick, or less, seems like less of a dick, than some of the map powers and what have you of the world. He does have a background in geology. He, I believe, he firmly believes what he's saying. But his rationale, his level of evidence is so low that I find a hard time throwing out established science for his new argument when it's nothing more as presented here than just a story. Granted, I've said this already, this talk was not some sort of lecture, right? This was talking to a bunch of people on YouTube. There's no citations, no references in the original video. He's not trying to go in depth. But why couldn't you give me some reference? Why couldn't you publish a paper on your website? Why couldn't you do a bit more to verify your claim before you go out and say your claim? That's the thing that's lacking here. A more explanation would be nice. If it exists out there, I haven't found it, sweet. Let me know what it is. We'll have that conversation. Again, I'll, I'll give Indiana Joe Hubbard this. He doesn't come off like the flying prick that some of these other creationists have. So, kudos to you, man. <laughs>